Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Miola Azrova, and I welcome you today from uh, Vancouver. Uh, but uh, the people that we work to put this together are all over the world, and so are our attendees. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar uh, on migration and business, current issues and future trends. Uh, you see our lovely presenters there. I will um, introduce them momentarily. Uh, I wanted to open this uh, to, uh, by saying that uh, this is an uh, effort uh, by a lot of people. Uh, there's many that have been involved in uh, putting this together, uh, and you see all of their names. Uh, colleagues of mine here at Simon Fraser University, uh, the Center for International Human Resource Studies at Penn State, uh, RIT Croatia, uh, ESCP Business School uh, in Europe, uh, and also Clarion University. To all of you, thank you uh, for um, creating this wonderful webinar. Uh, this is the 14th or 15th of those webinars. Uh, we have a YouTube channel on which you can revisit uh, all of the talks. We'll uh, put this one there as well. Uh, in terms of practicalities, uh, given that we're together for a very short time, uh, we uh, have disabled uh, texting. Uh, but of course, this is only an hour. Uh, and we hope this is the beginning of a conversation at the end of the conversation, and you'll take an opportunity to connect with the speakers and other fellow uh, attendees. Uh, and with that, uh, let's get to the main event today. I'm very, very pleased to be joined by three wonderful people today. Uh, Aida Jairo, uh, who has a double appointment to the University of Leeds and VU. Uh, which stands for Vienna University of Economics and Business, uh, and her uh, colleague uh, Milda Zielinskaite, who is also at VU. Uh, and uh, on this panel today, uh, we also uh, are very pleased to be uh, joined by uh, someone from the practitioner world. Uh, and this is Paul Baldazzari, who is the Executive uh, VP of U.S. Component Operations, Strategy, and Excellent at Flex. Uh, so Paul will be uh, joining Milda and Aida today. Uh, uh, their um, bios, they're extremely accomplished, are on the event side. And just in the interest of, of time, I hope they will forgive me uh, for not reading the whole thing. Uh, and with that, over to you, uh, Milda and Aida. Thank you so much for, for the kind introduction and Mila to you and the entire organizer team uh, for making the preparation for this webinar so smooth, such a smooth ride. Uh, Aida and Paul and myself are really happy to be here today. And we'll go straight to the presentation in the interest of time and to save uh, space for discussion. So migration and business current issues and future trends. Um, I'd like to start with a couple common assumptions or even myths, if I may say, about migration. So the first thing that comes to many people's minds when we hear the word migration today is the supposed increase in numbers and, and the idea that we live in a time of unprecedented mass migration. And along with that, especially if you look at the media headlines, you see also the assumption that there's uninterrupted rise in forced migration and along with that, rise in climate refugees or the climate change induced migration apocalypse. Um, relatedly, there is a common assumption um, in the media and, and even in scholarship that it's mostly citizens of low income countries who are most likely to emigrate. And the last point here, um, that migration is one of the most pressing societal challenges of our times giving all of the above. Aida will actually touch upon that at the end of today's presentation but we'll start with the first four points and go a little bit into the facts that, that may challenge these assumptions. So now let's have a look at the facts. So has the world become more migratory is the title of a paper published by the social, sociologist Heinde Haas and political economist um, Matthias Zeiska. So today there are around approximately 281 million international migrants in the world. So if all these migrants lived in one state, it would be the fourth most populous country in the world after China, India, and the United States, approximately equal to the size of the entire population of Indonesia. However, the situation can be also viewed from a different perspective. The migrant total remains a very small percentage of the world's total population, currently 3.6%, meaning that most people reside in the countries in which they were born. And what you can see here on the right hand side, uh, you can see two graphs. The above graph shows the increase in absolute numbers of international migrants between 1960 and 2010. 
So you can see that there has been an increase, but we also have to keep in mind that the population has also increased during this time period, the world, the world population. And now if we go below, you see uh, the relative number of international migrants. So in, for example, 1960, international migrants were around 3.1% of the world population. This percentage went in down, 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 then it starts going up again. And 50 years later, international migrants were again 3.1% of the world population. So among these 281 million international migrants are 169 million labor migrants who are of particular interest for us, business and management scholars. There are 26.4 million refugees. The number of refugees is the highest on record, but the annual rate of growth has slowed since. 2012, and important to keep in mind is that most of these refugees, 85% of these refugees, are in developing neighboring countries, and they are not in the developed world as it's very often assumed or perceived when we look at the media. So less pronounced, but also very important, is the number of internal migrants. So there are around 606, 763 million internal migrants. So, which means that the great majority of people do not migrate across borders, much larger num numbers migrate within countries. So I have been asked once, if the relative number of international migrants hasn't increased, why should we bother as business and management scholars? So while it hasn't increased that much, although today it's 3.6, uh, there have been important changes in migration patterns over the last seven decades. And of particular relevance for us business scholars are the changes in the geography and composition of international migrants. So compared with 75 years ago, migrants of today hail from any number of European countries and they are concentrating in a shrinking pool of prime destination countries. Yeah, think about migration before the Europeans were conquering the world and now uh, this has changed, the directionality has changed. So between 1960 and 2000, it means in only 40 years, net immigration countries, countries where migrants come from, increased from 124 to 148, while net immigration countries, countries they go to shrank from 102 to 78. And today, roughly two thirds of all international migrants live in 20 countries of the world. And all of this reflects also the asymmetric nature of globalization processes. Now, these changes in migration patterns have also transformed aspects of the contemporary context in which firms operate. So what has changed? So what we witness today is a multiplicity of countries of origin. Migration scholars call this phenomenon superdiversity, a term coined by Stephen Bertovitz. And there is an increased educational level of immigrants in high income economies. So most of high skilled migrants or many concentrate in the cities. And to give a couple of examples, the by foreign born, foreign born population is around 80%, Toronto's is approximately 50%, and Sydney, London, and New York are nearing 40%. Demographers predict that the largest inflow of migrants to cities around the world is yet to come. So by 2030, 60% of the world population may be in cities which raises many interesting questions. One that could be of interest to us business scholars is what insights can be gained from exploring the interface between global cities as economic hubs, their relationship with transnational migrant communities and the effects on multinational enterprises. So today we will not have time to go into depth and discuss the topic of high scale migration, but we would like to recommend to you a book recently published by William Kerr from Harvard University it's titled The Gift of Global Talent, How Migration Shapes Business, Economy and Society. And now to the second change in the context, to the context in which firms operate, we witness also fluctuations in labor supply in middle income economies countries that were known for supply of low skilled labor. I will not go into that here because Milda and Paul will elaborate upon this. And uh, last but not least, there have been important economic, political and social cultural impacts of migration in both migrant sending and migrant receiving countries. So changes in migration patterns along with the introduction of new means of communication and transportation. Uh, have also transformed the way individuals and institutions are linked across national borders 
and they have given us the rights to trans migrants. These are migrants who are very well integrated in their new countries, in their host societies, but who maintain very important multiple linkages with their home countries. And these transnational linkages have brought changes uh, to individual orientations, to national cultural values and norms patterns of consumptions, and also important processes of economic development in both migrant sending and migrant receiving countries. Yeah, so these are some basic facts and context. Now, what aspects of migration do we currently study? And uh, please note, this is a very informal overview, but we do believe it reflects to some extent also what we see among the recent publications in the mainstream business and management literature. What we have here in this illustration is simply a collection of research topics. We asked around 100 scholars who are right now members of uh, Migration Business and Society, a, a new initiative that we'll briefly present at the end of today's presentation. We simply asked them what research topics they're working on at the moment. And it's great to see that there's a lot of effort going into studying refugees and refugee integration. Um, also workplace integration uh, of high-skilled migrants, which may be um, an intuitive topic for us, but this is really a gap in other um, fields that have been focusing on migration, such as sociology, political science, and labor economics. So it's a good gap we're filling there. And uh, entrepreneurship and trade migration nexus have also recently uh, caught more attention among business scholars, which are all great things. Now, Two populations that we don't see as much work on yet um, are the lower or semi-skilled migrant workers and also internal migrants. And as Aida pointed out earlier, the numbers sort of speak for themselves and maybe we should devote a bit more attention to these two groups. Um, I will say a couple more things about the lower skilled or se and semi-skilled migration. So, the unsurprising fact that, that many of us are probably aware of is that a, a large majority, you know, two thirds of migrant workers reside in high income countries, around 30% in middle income countries and a very, very small percentage in low income countries. But what is more of a surprise perhaps is that in the past years, we started seeing high income countries experiencing an actual drop in migrant workers. And this may be coming along with the offshoring of the production and factory work, of course. Um, at the same time, upper middle income countries are picking up in, in the reception of migrant workers. So 7.8 increase, quite a significant increase from 2013 to 2019 alone. And this has immense implications for the activities of multinational firms and for the reshoring, homeshoring and nearshoring debates. I would like to read a quote from uh, the Chief Human Resource Officer at Semperit here. Um, Semperit is an, a, a rubber manufacturer, rubber and silicon, if I'm not mistaken, manufacturer headquartered in Austria, but with factory locations um, in many different countries. And here he was talking about Hungary. So he said, in Europe, we have a huge labor shortage. I could observe this with different plants in Hungary. Now note, Hungary is that nearshoring location for an Austrian headquartered company. So initially companies like ours were bringing in people from different regions of Hungary or Hungarian speaking Romanians and Serbians. Um, after that labor pool was utilized, we started recruiting first Hungarian speakers, then also non-Hungarian speakers from Ukraine. And then actually today they ran out of those workers too. And now they're seeking to attract workers from Philippines and Vietnam very different cultures, very different contexts. Now, um, the, what, what is fascinating is Hungary is, is one of the countries with the, in Europe with one of the harshest uh, anti-immigration um, public discourses in, in, the, in the national politics. But at the same time, behind the scene, they're opening these new bilateral migration corridors for Philippines, for Vietnam, and for Mongolia. And Hungary is just one example but we see a lot of this happening in all over Eastern Europe or the former Soviet bloc countries. We also see this in locations like Malaysia and Taiwan and many other countries that used to be, as Aida said, migrant sending countries, but have recently become for the first time in history, migrant receiving countries. 
And some of these countries are um, precisely the rich country's neighbors, so to say. So they would be the uh, optimal nearshoring locations, you know, thinking logically. Um, but now they themselves have lower skilled labor shortages and the increase of local labor costs in these countries has, uh, there, there's been a huge increase. And Paul, I believe, will say a couple of words from his personal experience in relation to this. Um, an important implication for firms is therefore that there may be more than just reshoring the production. It's probably almost inevitable that there will be a need to increase um, the number, the share of workers with migration backgrounds if you choose to home shore or near shore. And a related point um, that comes hand in hand with this is human and labor rights as outlined in the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, human and labor rights of these lower skilled or semi-skilled migrant workers. Um, now, there's a lot of knowledge in the nonprofit sector on this and also in the public policy and sociology. Every time you hire somebody from overseas, uh, you are probably in the need to employ middleman companies, intermediaries that help with the recruitment and the hiring processes. Very few multinationals actually have the potential to dispatch direct recruiters to overseas. And these Intermediaries have been historically infamous for unethical hiring practices. And uh, there's a lot of work of how the hugest burden is placed on the individual workers. So as you can see here, um, a graph, an infograph from um, IHRB, an NGO and FinTech, an individual, let's say a Nepalese who wants to get a job with a multinational, Western multinational um, with the factories in Malaysia, uh, has to go through all these middlemen uh, organizations to end up in Malaysia and in the process may acquire a huge debt. And um, sometimes, um, you know, some of NGOs estimated that to get a job in Taiwan, a worker may need up to a year's, one year's future income to just to cover these recruitment and hiring costs. Uh, similarly, workers in the US, I know an agricultural reason, uh, region, uh, sorry, agricultural industry, um, pay uh, up to $10,000 to get through that recruitment process. And the burden is, is huge and may lead to forced labor. Now, um, a question to all of us is, you know, how much of one year's or two year's salary, how much would we be willing to pay to get a job abroad? Um, that's a rhetorical question, but also what we don't know enough is how these intermediary companies operate and also um, how the multinational corporations engage with them or how they could shift their resources toward not engaging with them. And again, maybe Paul will comment some more from his experience here. One more point that's now a hot topic in regards to the lower skilled and semi-skilled migration. And, and generally, we all keep hearing about Industry 4.0 and how for many corporations, COVID-19 has catalyzed the investments in digital technologies and artificial intelligence. What we don't know as well yet um, is what impact the AI has on migration um, flows and migrant experiences. We know that countries now are using AI to control the migration flows, the inflows and outflows. Um, and there are also AI mechanisms as far as migrant worker support. So this may imply new challenges in staffing that until recently were only applicable to high skilled and it could be a very interesting question to explore. And then uh, beside the recruitment process, the actual management of lower or semi-skilled migrant workers once they're in the factories um, it has to do with the, the new advances in robotics. So again, I'll leave this for Paul because neither Aida nor I are specialists in robots. And it's through Paul that we learned the term Cobots or collaborative robots, robots that need human assistance and need flexible human workers uh, oper to operate um, along, uh, along with them. And uh, would this mean replacing human workforce or actually more reskilling or upskilling migrant workers in global value chains? And uh, we have a quote from one of Paul's colleagues actually at Flex, uh, who told us, since the cost of automation is decreasing, fewer workers are needed for redundant process-based tasks. At the same time, however, we are creating new jobs. This seems counterintuitive because smart factories can indeed run with less human labor, 
but an automated factory, left alone, cannot be competitive in long term. So and now there are many more questions to be considered, but for the sake of time, we will zoom on three aspects. Uh, so one is remittances. Um, migrant remittances are the lifeblood of economic development. Today, around 29 countries have a remittance to a GDP ratio above 10%. And according to Dilip Ratko, lead economist at the World Bank, remittances act as insurance. So in times of crisis, migrants send even more money home by drawing on their savings or reducing their own consumption. So although it was, for example, projected that the pandemic would cause a dramatic decline in remittances, official recorded numbers in 2020 dropped by only 1.6%. However, transaction costs remain too high and lead to high risk informal money transfer channels. So sending remittances still averages 6.4% of the amount sent. It should be reduced to 3%. And there are many more questions, unaddressed questions regarding gender and generational differences. So taking generational differences as an example. So first generation migrants will maintain the strong links to their home country and they will be sending remittances back to their family members. So on second generation migrants, there is also a soft spot. So they will continue sending some money back, if not to their relatives, then in form of charity money, or they will invest into something in, back in their home countries. But what about first generation migrants? And is there something like a fourth generation migrant? And so exploring the psychology behind remittances is an interesting topic that deserves more of our attention and that we know would be also of interest to the World Bank. Yeah. And uh, we have many more topics to consider, but because of lack of time, we just chose two more and uh, just out of interest. Uh, climate migration, uh, as we mentioned at the very beginning, of course, there's a lot of talk about the climate refugees but we just wanted to, to note that there is still a, a huge gap in data. There's lack of comprehensive data on this topic so far. What we know is that slow onset changes in climate, such as droughts and uh, increased temperatures, seem to have more likelihood to increase migration than sudden catastrophic events that kind of produce more temporarily migration with a return. Um, but also at the same time, environment is only one of the many factors that shape migration and, and cannot be, uh, right now, there's no evidence that it's a decisive factor. In addition, um, you know, there's often talk about how the poorest and the most disadvantaged communities will migrate because of the climate shifts. Um, that's also still an open question because a lot of times it's these people who do not have access to formal migration channels and actually get left behind. So migration experts in sociology and uh, political science tend to question this narrative of unprecedented climate change induced mass migration, or at least are leaving that as an open question for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, now refugees, I would like to start by saying that some great work is being done in this area on refugee employment and also refugee integration into their workplaces. The question to ask is, for us, maybe what identity do we want to give refugees? Are these victims, are these people in need for help? Or is there more to this narrative? So we know that against all odds, refugees are resilient, they are innovative, they are able and very much willing to work. And sometimes they succeed in life, not uh, despite the trauma, sometimes also because the trauma, and this is evidence in the post-traumatic growth literature, uh, we like the way Alex uh, Sandra Betts, Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs at Oxford University, and also Hamdi Lakuya, the founder and CEO of Chubani and the Tent Partnership for Refugees, portray refugees. For example, in one of his TED Talks, Alex Betts stated, we need to find rational, realistic ways of managing this, not based on the old logics of humanitarian assistance, not based on logics of charity, but building on the opportunities offered by globalization, markets, and mobility. And Hamdi Lakuya is famous for his quote, the minute a refugee gets a job, that's when they stop being a refugee. I mean, we always have to keep in mind that we are producing the research, but we are also teaching students who are future practitioners and leaders. So for them to motivate them to employ refugees, maybe there should be also more of this narrative that they have agency. 
And one last final thing also to keep in mind that post-traumatic stress syndrome can sometimes be delayed. It can be delayed for years. And I know from my own experience, sometimes even for decades. So and now we are already going to our concluding thoughts. So, and I'm going also back to Mil what Milda talked about, uh, you know, myths and common assumptions about migration. As one development analyst put it, migration has been politicized before it has been analyzed. And also in business and management, we have the tendency to call it a grand challenge. And I insisted during this presentation that I say this because in one of my papers, I also call it grand challenge. And I called it grand challenge without really paying attention how do we define grand challenges in business and management. And so we defined it as a specific critical barrier that if removed would help solve an important societal problem. So now imagine that we are writing this and we hope that our findings will be picked up by the general public. And I know that we don't want the general public to misinterpret our findings. And also again, going back to the students, um, we are also teaching this topic in the classroom to people who in their future could actually shape migrant workforce management. So yeah. I couldn't agree more that we should be careful in not portraying migration as a barrier or a problem to be solved. It's, a, it's an, you know, as, as Heinz der Haas, one of the leading sociologists on the topic, his quote he illustrates, it's an actually integral part of, of development and global transformation processes. Mm -hmm. So we are about done, but I will just, um, before we move on, very briefly acknowledge that much of our thinking and actually many of the contents behind today's presentation were inspired by uh, Migration Business and Society, which is a new initiative um, right now, a network, but we hope in the future, perhaps a think tank dedicated to understanding the relationship between business and migration by bringing scholars from different fields, business practitioners, human rights experts together for the idea and expertise exchange. If you're interested more in the work here, um, the link is provided below, uh, or you can simply Google Migration Business and Society and it will pop up. And just very briefly about how the initiative works. Exactly. So. You know, we we thought that the problem, not problem, the phenomenon of migration is so complex that it needed a cross-sectoral, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary collaboration. So we have an advisory board with their help. Uh, we would like to generate practice-informed interdisciplinary and scope research questions on migration, business, and society that will guide future efforts at business schools. And you will see here we have uh, practitioners, we have policy experts and human rights experts on board, as well as academics. Um, so. Co-signers are equally important category for us. We right now on purpose are slowly expanding this category and with their help, we hope to strive for concrete impact and practice. And then we have our core for all endorsers community that includes business scholars, but also fellow academics from other disciplines uh, who engage in knowledge generation and exchange with the aim to advance migration research and teaching. And so um, you see me, you may be recognizing a lot of friendly faces here and perhaps you are one of those friendly faces. And in, in, in that case, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we are approaching nearly 100, uh, 100 endorsers and we couldn't be happier about this. And we're also really happy that among our endorsers are people not just from interdisciplinary, but also cross disciplinary backgrounds and from across different levels of academic careers. So from PhD students to postdoctoral researchers to uh, senior or and very senior uh, scholars. If you're interested in joining the initiative, simply email Aida or myself. And I have one more last slide. Um, this is the advisory board. And again, we just like to acknowledge that a lot of the things that we said today came from our discussions with the advisory board members, half of whom are senior academics and half our practitioners who really fed us the information from the field. And we couldn't be happier that one of them is with us today, Paul Baldassari. So as Mila mentioned, Paula is, Paul is Executive Vice President of Operations Strategy and Excellence at Flex and also former Chief Human Resource Officer there. Now Flex, for those of you who don't know, is the third largest electronics contract manufacturer worldwide, um, headquartered in uh, San Francisco in, in the US and um, Singapore. 
Uh, Paul has in, in the supported our initiative since the very beginning. So we're really happy, Paul, that you're joining us today. Um, and uh, we're really, well, I think you're jet lagged, right? And, <laughs> and very, very busy between important meetings. So, so even more appreciated. Uh, if you could share your insights um, on the challenges that you've been facing regarding international and internal migration at your company and migrant workers management, and then if there are some minutes remaining also to touch upon the industry 4.0 and the future of migrant workers management from your perspective, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much, Milda. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thanks for um, having me today. I'm joining you from uh, San Jose in the heart of the Silicon Valley, right? And um, as you mentioned, uh, I got up early this morning with jet lag and it kind of reminded me how important it is um, to think about and be pa uh, passionate about migrant workers, especially lower skilled migrant workers. So I'm sitting here on a beautiful office floor and, and we have a, some expats like many other big companies as well, right? And in the whole Bay Area, you have a lot of expats and there's a lot of um, research done and a lot of support in companies as well. Every big company has their, their own mobility department to support experts. But when I came in into the office this morning, five o'clock, way too early, um, most of the people I met were actually uh, of a Latin American origin. And uh, many I know from, you know, you meet people over coffee or every morning I meet the same team from the security team. Those are all migrants, right? And those are all people that keep uh, our beautiful offices and our beautiful operations running here. Um, but there is very little research done uh, to support them. And um, as you mentioned, uh, Ida and Milda, um, I ran um, HR here in Flex for a couple of years. And uh, for many years, I'm running also employee services, um, which takes care of everything that we provide from cafeterias to transportation and so on. And we have thousands of, of migrant workers in the company. And uh, I've met many colleagues, uh, other CHROs, um, other people uh, from NGOs, uh, from supply chain functions in companies. And um, I kind of found that most of the people actually want to do well, um, but we are still lacking the know-how how to do that. Um, there is a only a very small group of people, I would say, that are less interested. But most of the people want to do no, I want to do well. But uh, the challenge is, we don't have the theoretical background, nor the education background yet, um, to be as effective as as we should be. And uh, that's why I'm super thankful, and I'm happy to work uh, with uh, Ida and Milda. And thank you, Milda, for um, hosting us here at IHRM and the full team and all of the people joining here because. I think we can make a big difference by uh, doing more research on uh, lower skilled migrant workers and more education in, uh, for, in, for companies uh, to do better. Uh, the challenges that I've seen are a multitude, right? Uh, starting from people turning a blind eye on recruiting practices, which opens up a gap that uh, some companies or agencies exploit um, up to the challenge that you have when you have uh, a large pool of migrant workers work in a, in a larger factory and you house them as well. You're not only responsible for the working conditions, but you're also responsible for the living condition, for the dormitories, for the transportation, for the cafeteria and so on. And this is highly complex. Um, and uh, quite a few companies are uh, struggling with that and outsource that or, or, you know, just pay someone a lot of money to take care of that for them. Um, and that opens up uh, all these uh, unfortunate opportunities uh, for uh, bad players to exploit. Uh, again, from my experience, I think there is only very few people that really want to exploit and, and a lot of people just don't know better. So um, for us, and that's why I'm um, happy to work with researchers and also try to get more into research and, and education. For us, it's a big obligation to learn more about it, write more about it and teach more about it. Um, because I can tell you from a practical experience, companies struggle to find um, people that get already that kind of know-how from their business school education. We do a lot in practice uh, from like trial and error, but this is a way too important subject yeah, to do errors because errors can cost a lot of money. That's kind of the best case, but they can also do harm. That's the worst case, right? And, and that would be, for example, if you just give an agency money and tell them, get me 
unskilled or low skilled workers because then we open up uh, uh, the unfortunate opportunities that people exploited and, and charge uh, enormous hiring fees to uh, the, the, the low skilled migrants um, or exploit them in other ways by keeping visas and passports and so on. So to, to go back into the positives, I, I see people really want to do well. I think we've made also some good progress, especially with industry associations. Uh, we started to set standards. Um, there is more interest as well from uh, OEMs that drive that uh, ethical behavior in the supply chains. Um, we also set a more level playing, uh, playing field by making sure that there are certain supply chain standards that everybody has to follow. Um, but there's still much more work to be done. So if you go into the details, like what's okay, two people in a, in a room in a, in a dormitory, four people in a room in a dormitory, or eight people in a room in a dormitory. Um, I kind of took my personal ethical decision. I, I was serving in the army and thought like, you know, if it's as good as army standard, it's probably okay. And from there we want to do better. But if it's below army standard, uh, it's not acceptable. But at the end, you know, we need to have a certain calibration and standards globally that we can set um, where and, and decide, you know, what's the right way uh, to provide people cafeteria, uh, transportation services, security, and so on and so on um, to enable decent living conditions for them. Um, as uh, Aida and Milda mentioned, uh, migrant workers play a very important role in, I would say, pretty much every supply chain today. With COVID, we have seen that there is a massive labor shortage globally. Um, so if you look into pretty much every economy has, has now a, a massive labor shortage and they're trying to hire people from, from other locations. So I think uh, the migrant worker um, flows will even accelerate. I know from the industry that I'm working and uh, the agencies um, that I'm, I'm talking to, um, they see a massive inflow and uh, flows that we've not seen before, like uh, Filipinos getting hired into Hungary, um, more uh, different cultures getting into, into the US and so on and so on. So um, the opportunity to do better here is definitely increasing by the day. Um, and this is key for companies to keep their supply chains afloat and, and for all of us as consumers as well. We've seen that in COVID um, to make sure that we continue to have a, a, a working economy um, and also there are many places like uh, Europe where we were we were de uh, depending on migrant workers on essential services uh, like taking care of the elderly and so on. So um, it is a, is a very hot topic. Um, like uh, you asked, Milda, um, there is also large flows uh, from um, in-country migrant workers. Um, for example, in China, you have a large migrant workforce that is uh, supporting the industry, I would say, around um, the, the western part of China, but also India, you have uh, millions or hundreds of millions of people. And uh, it's a kind of a, a tight definition um, for you, who you perceive as a migrant worker. The definition that we've chosen is people that are um, out of the social network, um, that are for months or for, for years out of the transferring uh, somewhere out of the social network. And uh, those people need the similar support. Uh, they need support in settling down, creating a new so, um, social network, um, making sure that they have the right living conditions, um, that they're not exploited uh, by agencies. And um, that has also some additional challenges because uh, at least when people move from country to country, there are certain regulations about passports and uh, making sure that there is uh, medical checks and so on. Um, that uh, normally don't take place for those in-country migrant workers. Um, so it's a, a less supported, less uh, researched um, and less controlled market and therefore has more opportunity for exploitation. So this area, I would say, deserves even an extra effort on research, um, education for, for employers and continuous focus uh, to better the situation for migrant workers and, and really to support them. Um, that includes the, the housing, um, but also this, the security that is very important for us. Um, for many of us in, in the Western world, um, things that are normal, like that you can get into a bus and, uh, or, or take a taxi and, and be more or less certain, right, that nothing bad will happen to you. 
in many of those countries, uh, people get exploited by transportation. They may get robbed or, or even worse, right? So um, as an employer, we took, for example, responsibility to provide our own transportation with our own security. And, and that's a big differentiator for our migrant workers because uh, it gives them peace of mind um, and, and make sure that uh, people have a, a decent way of getting to work and a decent uh, way uh, to be treated even outside of the factory. Um, last but not least, um, I want to talk about the, the major changes uh, that are happening because there is the labor shortage on one side, on the other side, uh, a lot of automation, kind of counter um, to what uh, we read in newspapers. Um, automation is, is not reducing a lot of demand uh, for migrant workers, but it's kind of changing the demand and it's changing the focus. Um, so you see this uh, major shortage of uh, unskilled workers globally and uh, companies are kind of forced into being more productive and that's driving a lot of the automation investment. But at the same time, it's driving up uh, the need for semi-skilled workers. So meaning uh, that you train people up to a certain uh, education level that they can understand the high complex automated line and, and automate those equipment. Um, and migrant workers are many times chosen for that because they're more stable, I would say. Um, there is less turnover with migrant workers than with local workers. Um, at the same time, if you think about a migrant worker, someone leaving the family and the social network behind because uh, they, they take the burden to uh, get into better uh, living conditions. And many times people also do that for their families, right? They take the money, re send this as remittance home. So these are very courageous people that uh, um, you know, give up a lot of uh, their, their social network um, to make sure that they provide better living conditions uh, for their families and their communities. And with that, um, they, are, they are great to, to, if you offer migrant workers education, they really pick up a very well on that um, and they're very eager to learn. And with that, uh, myself and also my colleagues in other companies made really good experiences um, in, in providing them training opportunities and offering them jobs um, that are less repetitive and, and require more, more of a skill set of thinking, of system thinking. Um, and I see that trend continuing, especially when you look at the uh, um, headlines like from the World Economic Forum this, this uh, week that uh, Germany, for example, will face a, a shortage of about 2 million um, semi-skilled workers in 2030. That's uh, only eight years to go. Um, somewhere those people will not come from Europe, right? So uh, we have to think more how we can enable um, migrant workers to be successful in that for the better of the mi uh, migrant workers, but also for the, for the better of um, the economies in, I would say, in the Western economies. So there is a, is a huge opportunity. And um, again, as researchers and practitioners, in partnership, we can make a real difference here um, to research how we can ensure that we provide the right hiring conditions, the right living conditions, and the right working conditions to migrant workers to enable them and to enable all of us to be successful. Um, that's kind of the, the concept uh, that you mentioned about human supply chains, how to make sure that we make through all those steps of, uh, of, of a career of a migrant worker, we make that a, a better experience and a more sustainable experience for of us. Um, so that's from my, from my practical experience. There is much, much more to tell, but uh, I want to thank all of you for, for joining here and, and showing your um, energy and your passion about the subject. I'm sure together we can make a big difference and I think we'll go next step uh, for, for Q&A. Okay, thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Milda uh, and Aida. Uh, and in fact, I wanted to share with everybody I, that we did get a note in the Q&A that a class, an entire class is watching this presentation. So uh, thank you so much for bringing the students here. I think that's fantastic because everybody should hear about this. Uh, and we don't have much time, uh, but uh, questions can go in every direction. Uh, let me start with my academic hat on uh, first with a question to Aida and Milda, and then a question to Paul. Um, so the question is not really my question. It's a question from Stacy Fitzsimmons, uh, who uh, thanks Aida and Milda for the review of phenomena and the myth busting. And she also asks, 
I'm curious about which theoretical lenses you see as most promising in research about migration. And it goes on, and I really like the second question. More controversially, are there any theoretical lenses in research stream that you think are overused? So um, thinking that this is the International HR webinar, uh, you know, maybe if you can put that hat on for a bit and uh, answer that question, or these questions. Do you want to start? So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, theoretical lenses in migration research, isn't it? This was the question. Uh, so one of the things that's constantly popping up when we when we read research um, in the migration field is the the phenomena, the the theory around transnationalism, and you know what I mentioned at the beginning and how these transnational linkages that the migrants maintain are changing both uh, national values and norms in their home countries and uh, their host countries. And this high contradicts, uh, you know, the cultural distance measures that we use in IB and in management in general. And I think these changes in migration patterns that we have overlooked in business and management have and are contributing to changes in the societies that we are still overlooking because we are being caught in the old paradigms Mm -hmm. that still are valid, but just think uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, that two thirds of all international migrants are concentrated in, was it 20, 20, countries. 20 countries of the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the number of skilled migrants has increased a lot. This was not in the past. So you would have the low skilled migrants and they would, I, I have seen this in Vienna, they would stuck in their communities and they would be partly separated from the Viennese society. Now you have the skilled migrants who are more influential, who are part of the institutions and who are then also co-creating and reshaping the institutions. So if national contexts are changing, it means that the individuals we employ are changing. They don't have necessarily the host or home country mindset. And also when it comes to cross-border mergers and acquisitions, what we have studied in this context is the knowledge mechanism, you know, how migrants in, let's say, uh, the US who are originally from China help Chinese companies to get market entry into the US, United States. But in the meantime, these migrants, Chinese migrants in the United States have also transformed institution, consumption patterns, individual orientations in the United States as well, which makes it even more easier for the Chinese companies to get access and one question that I'm struggling sometimes with, like most of these migrants, 70% of them go to developed economies, you know? So how much of our whole societies are they changing and are the competitive advantages shifting? When you think uh, if Chinese migrants make it easier for Chinese companies to get entry into the US market, what happens with American companies in China and now keep in mind that uh, in China, the percentage of international migrants is 0 0.1. You know, it's very low. So I think th these, these are interesting aspects that we can, um, you, know, in, in, you know, infuse into our thinking. I think um, I can only add to that as, um, since my background is actually not originally uh, at, at the business school, I was surprised to see how little there is on transnationalism from the migrant Ooh. transnationalism perspective, not the company transnationalism perspective here, because that has been studied in anthropology and political science and sociology since 1990s, but always at the very nuclear level, at the individual level or small group family level. And if we managed to add the organizational meso level to that, we would also enhance these other disciplines. And uh, Stacy, I love the question about what has been overused. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting myself into trouble here. It's not per se the theory, but just the categorization, you know, within the acculturation literature, just that there are only these four integration, assimilation, separation, and marginalization. We know Marioko Brannan and others have challenged that. And Stacy, you're also part of of the group that has looked into marginalization from a different perspective, but we think there, there should be more there. There's more to pick up from the cross-cultural psychology. There's a whole coping and stress paradigm. There are other paradigms about how the transnational identity is born that are much beyond the just host and just home cultures 
Not to mention that today's migrants could have multiple identities and not just home and host societies. So, yeah. So we'll yeah. we'll leave the we'll maybe leave the one last question, question because <laughs> Stacy, for those of who don't know, is really an expert in multiculturalism. Yeah. And and you know there is this other perspective of super diversity, which is very much in line with Stacy's work as well. And also Stacy, you are the one who introduced also intersectionality to IB, or one of the scholars who introduced this and this whole issue of intersectionality is being pronounced and discussed uh, within this super diversity perspective by Steve Gertowitz's work that we could uh, recommend to international management and management and business scholars to have a look at. So. Wonderful. Now, uh, I also had a question that uh, I, it's really can be answered both from an academic standpoint, but maybe from a practitioner standpoint as well. Uh, I was uh, I was really reflecting on your point that we shouldn't be framing migration as a great challenge. So I I I, I agree with that. It's uh, but then I also think how do we frame it because it, it is an opportunity, but an opportunity that comes with challenges, right? There are lots of things to be done, as Paul was talking about bettering the life of the worker and a lot of issues uh, that migrants and refugees are facing. So if you shift away from framing it as a challenge, how do you frame it to maintain both the positivity, but also the, yeah, the difficulties? I'm struggling for the right words here. Yeah, I, um, I would uh, follow and then I would just add something. I, I, I would frame it as, a, as, as you said, as an opportunity, more like from a paradox theory, right? Uh, in many cases, people see it as an either or, right? Can we afford to have the right hiring practices versus, um, you know, kind of taking the, the lowest cost possible way to, to, to attract people. Um, but I've seen many opportunities. If you see it from a paradox theory and you work hard enough in the problem, you come out with a win-win, right? Um, like, like I mentioned before on Industry 4.0, if you provide the education and you get people to kind of a semi-skilled level, you optimize and you get much more out of a migrant worker um, then, then many times from a local worker that uh, is, is moving on or where you have higher attrition. Um, if you do, if you hire a migrant worker in the right way and you provide all the housing and so on, it's actually more expensive than a local worker, but you get other opportunities as an organization. So um, I think paradox theory could, could be great to provide all these opportunities and then also provide a practical um, handbook of, uh, of opportunities for companies to look into and um, utilize for the better economic outcome and the better social and sustainability outcome. This is a brilliant answer. The practitioner saying, look at paradox theory. But that, that, that's really great uh, because it, it is, uh, I, I do like that framing. Uh, Mil, do need anything to add? Um, if you call it a pressing global phenomena, it's maybe, you know, more neutral. My mm. only thing is, you know, because it, the, 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 this global phenomena is so often misused, mm. uh, you know, in politics, you mm. see it, you see what's happening and so on. So uh, if you label it differently, you give it a different identity and then this identity will influence the perceptions that the public has about migration, the perceptions that our students have about migration. And the perceptions can be very powerful. I mean, they can impact in institutions. And now it's the first time I think that we business scholars, I mean, we embarked on this topic, let's say really one decade ago, and we have the great opportunity to shape these perceptions yeah. it's, in a it's, way yeah. that will make the world a better place. <laughs> It's possibly as simple as, you know, uh, we've seen articles that list, you know, the grand challenges and let's say climate change, poverty, migration, infectious diseases. Maybe we should just be <laughs> careful about that type of wording. And it's not migration per se. I mean, uh, you know, we've been migrants for three million years of our history, right? We we're only settled 10,000 years ago. Maybe it's migration management that is a challenge that, you know, also add to what Paul said. Uh, but not the phenomena as, as itself. Hmm. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. There's four minutes, and I want to ask about 14 questions. But let me let me try uh, let me try with one. Um, from the perspective of a practitioner, Paul, have you seen a change in the conversation around migrants? 
I mean, the conversation about migrants in the academic literature, not in business, has been going on for a very long time. I think the business scholars have come to the dance party a little too late. So a decade ago, but that's still decades later after others have come. But from a business standpoint, have you seen in your rich and vast experience change in how we think and um, uh, think about migrant workforce and what to do about making their lives better? Absolutely, yeah. So first of all, there there is more awareness um, that that came from a movement of uh, you know NGOs and also um, that the press reporting about it, right? So there is this movement in supply chains to create uh, certain standards, and also the SDGs really helped in the conversation. Uh, in my early days, about 15, 20 years, when I started working on this topic, we spent a lot of time, you know, fighting about what's the right thing to do uh, and what are what about the wording as well, at least now with the SDGs and with the research, and we have a better baseline to go into the same direction. Um, we also tend to see migrants much more as an asset now. Um, there is more, much more investment in, in, in migrants um, because they are more expensive. If you hire migrants, um, in the, you, you invest in the right living and, and working conditions. Um, but also the opportunity and and this massive labor shortage that is really bringing global supply chains to their knees right now uh, is enforcing uh, even more investment, I would say, in migrant workers and uh, and, and developing their skill sets and driving the efficiency um, in in all of our operations. If you look at you know car uh, lead times, uh, lead times on many consumers' goods, inflation, all of that is driving a complete mindset change. So I think we are in a time where um, the momentum is really driving us to do something different. I can see that from my practitioner colleagues and I can see much more interest. And from the many number of people that have joined us today, I'm very positive that together between research and practice, we can drive a huge difference in a short amount of time. Wonderful, thank you. And as it happens in these webinars, the closer we get to the end, the more questions we have. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time, but those of you that ask questions, thank you. We will forward those to the presenters. Um, and I apologize, we simply don't have the time to get to them all, but uh, it's a testament to the importance of the topic of how many people want to engage uh, with the speakers. So thank you to uh, people that attended and obviously a huge thank you to uh, our three presenters today. That was really, really fascinating and certainly not the last time we talk about this. So we hopefully will have you back on the show soon. Uh, and speaking about uh, the show, uh, our international HRM webinar series, we do have a couple of more lined up, next one being on March 3rd. Uh, and it would be a presentation by Helen DeCherry and Karen Sanders, uh, who will talk about reimagining international HRM research. One of my colleagues will post a link in the chat, uh, and we hope you come to that as well. And with that, in a sadness, uh, I have to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Milda, Aida, and Paul, for a fascinating presentation. Thanks, everyone, for attending. See you next time. Thank you, Thank you Mila.